So first of all, uh, Procore is a construction software platform. Uh, we're a global company now, but it, uh, the, the backstory of the company is I'm one of these unique individuals that has have two uh, I have two skills in life, which is I am very I very much am involved in love construction, and I'm also a technologist. And so, uh, having grown up in the construction industry, I uh, had an opportunity at one point to become a real estate developer. So I uh, went from being a carpenter to a developer. Uh, again, learning more and more about how construction gets delivered, get learning more and more about how crazy and di how uh, disorganized and, and chaotic the construction process is. Uh, ended up getting a job in technology in the Bay Area. I was joking with someone today that. Anybody, everybody know what an IVR is? Mm -hmm. Most people don't. Interactive voice response. So before the internet, for the younger people in the crowd, uh, you used to have to call like to get your bank balance. You'd have to call on a telephone. I was the guy who programmed those telephone uh, systems. Really, really antiquated technology. But I was a software engineer, and then um, uh, found out early on that I was a much better sales software salesperson than an engineer. So I ended up selling uh, solutions, and then I ended up starting my own company. Lo and behold, in 1999, my wife said to me. Uh, we were living in the Bay Area. She said, hey, guess what? We're moving to Santa Barbara. And I said, <laughs> I said, no, we're not. I'm running my company in the Bay Area. And she said, no, no, your son and I are moving to Santa Barbara. Uh, there's an airport there, too. So if you want to see us, you'll come. So uh, that got us to Santa Barbara, bought a house, bulldozed the house. Uh, and then all of a sudden I realized, like, wow, all the chaos that I remembered about construction was still ex existed. Nobody had improved upon anything. But I had been working in the Bay Area, um, you know, helping Fortune 500 companies improve their business processes with technology. And I'm like, this is, like, this is something I can do. Uh, and I uh, way underestimated the uh, complexity of what I was taking on. And I also was arguably a decade plus early in, in the process. Um, but here we are today. Uh, we are a global company. We are built as a platform. We have uh, about a dozen products. We sell to owners, general contractors, and specialty contractors. And we sell to the enterprise mid-market SMB. We sell in the US. And then we have, uh, we have sales forces in 11 different countries. So we've, um, we've, we've, we've come a long way since those early days. I think that's a great way to finish because the segue is you're on the cusp of breaking through that billion dollar revenue mark. And that's kind of rarefied error for software companies. So, you know, if you look back, what do you think is maybe the, the one or two things that really made it successful to get there? And maybe it was, you know, give me something that maybe you learned. You're like, geez, boy, if I did it again, I'd do this differently. Yeah. Um, well, first we got really lucky because when I started Procore, the, uh, I was used to working with Oracle databases, uh, and I, got, I called my Oracle sales rep that I used to work with and I asked him for a quote for an Oracle, Oracle database, and it was 50 grand. And I was selling the software at the time that I was building at $95 a month, and so I'm like, if every customer has to have their own database, <laughs> like this is never going to work. So I just uh, added a company ID on the front of every table in my single database that I was using, uh, and um, ended up creating a SaaS platform in 2002 that was like, you know, just because I was too cheap to buy lots of databases. <laughs> But the reality was, it turned out we then developed a platform over time. So I think we got really lucky in the early days mm -hmm. uh, because of that, um, having a, a single code base, multi-tenant architecture really paid off. Uh, number one. Number two, I think um, the way that Procore, uh, it, the one thing I like people to think about Procore is we are not just a software company. We are a, a true partner to the industry that we serve. You can ask any one of our customers, and a lot of times what they'll talk about first is what Procore does as opposed to what Procore sells. Um, and so being the partner to the industry really helped. The industry had uh, be, had been served up a lot of really um, Non, not useful software prior to Procore, and so they were very dubious, and so you really had to earn their, their trust, and so partnering was a great way to do it. Um, and the other thing is, I think really it's helped us that all we do is construction. Um, you know, we have a lot of competitors that, I don't even know how these CEOs like, weave together a narrative as to what's most important, but that are doing different industries. Uh, construction's hard enough, uh, yeah. and the, the complexity of, of the industry is, is great enough. So, um, so I think that focus really helped us as well. Lots of lessons learned. Uh, <laughs> just the one thing that just came to mind was, um, I feel like I need to apologize to my wife. Um, I started selling Procore in 2002. Uh, keep in mind, the iPhone didn't come out until 2007. The iPad didn't come out until 2011. I essentially had written software for an industry that couldn't use my software. So uh, for the first decade and a half, uh, we were kind of wandering through a dark desert of uh, trying to find uh, early adopters. Uh, and it wasn't really until around 2015 that, that things started to take off. So, um, I probably could have, you know, kept a paycheck coming in for like a decade uh, from another line of work, and uh, so that was a lesson learned. The other thing is, um, I know founders love to talk about like their their hero's journey. Like this has not been a hero's journey. I'm going to be honest <laughs> with you. <laughs> uh, the, every day uh, we learn lessons. Actually, um, one of my uh, guy I call my co-founder, Steve Zom, used to we used to tell each other, all you had to do is make one better decision than all the bad decisions every single day, uh, and you will advance the business over time, mm -hmm. and um, and it works. So. Uh, you know, we, we made lots of mistakes along the way, but boy, did we learn a lot as we as we have grown. And now that we've been around for 21 years, um, you know, we got a lot of um, we got a lot of pattern recognition.
I, I knew you were onto something special when when you're still private and I went to Groundbreak, which for those that haven't done it, that's your your big user, you know, conference. And, you know, even as a private company, you had close to 2000 people that were showing up and, and really willing to talk about the, the use of the solutions. But one of the things that I also find investors don't really have a full appreciation for is just the state of the technology within the commercial construction or just the construction industry as a whole. Mm -hmm. Maybe give a sense, you know, what is that environment that you're you're selling into or yeah. fighting to improve? Yeah, uh, a lot of people love to talk about competition. Uh, our biggest competitor is Microsoft Office. So uh, more than 50% of the folks that we are selling to are literally running their construction companies or our specialty contracting company off of Excel, Outlook, and Word. Um, and the problem is, is that those are all very, very limited and uh, in an industry where any one particular project you're working on can have thousands of formal legal documents. Uh, that is just not, you know, there's no workloads and anything else. So the state of the industry is very much um, uh, still analog, we like to say. Um, the, the benefit of selling into the largest, least digitized industry on the planet is that we get to look at all the other, man, other in industries like manufacturing and finance that have already gone through the digital transformation and just basically steal the playbook, right? Because this is not, this, it's no different. Um, getting people to move off of manual processes onto automated processes, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's the same effort in just a different industry. So uh, going last in the digital transformation has really been a, a big benefit to us. Um, the other thing is I love to dispel the notion uh, people think of contractors as Luddites, or they, they think that they're just uh, technology phobic or whatever. Um, that's not true. Uh, some of the some of the smartest people I know work in construction, and some of the best Excel uh, jo jockeys I've ever met in my life <laughs> sit in job site trailers, not in investment banks. Um, uh, these guys can do things with Excel that will just blow your mind. Uh, and so, though they haven't been given lots of great technology over the years, they've figured out how to do a lot with it. But along those lines, do you think, you know, you kind of outlined the, the three core end customer markets, general contractors, owner operators, and, and specialty contractors, you know, what was the tip of the spear that got you in? And is there still just some demographics that are around the, the core ownership of, you know, when you look across maybe the ENC 500 general contractors, yeah. are there some demographics where maybe it's that next generation taking over that might help propel technology adoption? Absolutely. We had the... Um, uh, I guess the privilege of uh, providing our software to, I think it's 98% of every construction management program, university program in the United States, uh, trains the future workforce on pro tools. Uh, and, and that's pretty cool. That means that in the United States of America, if you get a construction diploma from any one of the universities, you basically are being taught pro tools. Uh, that really has a, a, a very big uplifting effect. Yeah. You know, a lot of um, general contractors have been doing this, their, their work, or specialty contractors, the same way for years. So the very first question they ask all their new hires is like, what are they, what are they teaching you? Uh, and also when they hire somebody out of another company, they'll be like, what software company, what software is the other company using? So we get this, um, we can come into corporations uh, for, as a, from a brand perspective, both through the university program as well as through people that leave other jobs and come in. Um, and that has a really big impact. Um, we've also heard our customers say that, you know, if you're a graduate from a um, uh, you know, construction management program and you're out talking to four different contractors, uh, you're going to ask them what technology stack they use because if they don't use technology, you're going to be in a world of hurt, and you know that. Yeah. And if they use old client server um, sp you know, solutions, you know you're in a world of hurt. If you're, if you're using one of those, those, those companies that they buy up a lot of software and they haven't woven them together yet, you're in a world of hurt. But if you're using Procore, you're using a state-of-the-art tool, and frankly, in a, in a world where there's... Uh, the, in construction, there's the biggest problem in construction is there's very few, there's too few people to build the things that need to get built. Uh, and so in the world where there's such a discrepancy between the number of people capable of getting jobs built and the number of jobs that need to get built, the power is in the hands of the of the employee, and they have a lot of sway in, in talking about where they want to work. So Procore seems to be an advantage for uh, folks uh, or customers to hire people. So looking at kind of the state of the company, state of the industry, et cetera, what has you most excited now? Hmm. Uh, like today, because I, no, I, I have, uh, I, I got to do, so one of the biggest privileges of being a founder of, of a tech company that does serves in construction is I get to go to do, do what are called job site walks, where I get to put on my construction clothes and my, my steel toe boots, and, uh, you know, so yesterday I did a job site walk in East Harlem uh, for a charter school, a $50 million charter school, uh, and what gets me most excited is seeing our solution in the hands of people uh, in real time actually doing their job. There was a guy named Mark um, who was a project superintendent, and Mark is a like out of central casting for the curmudgeon me, uh, sixty four year old superintendent New Yorker, right? Uh, and I'm like, oh gosh, uh, here we go. Mark could be one of two two personas for me, but it turns out Mark um, is the biggest power user on the job site. Uh, he had never used technology before Procore, 
uh, and the products that we put in his hand make his job so much easier that he is out there just, it was funny, we were walking together up a stairwell, and he's like, you know, Procore's punch list tool is so amazing. I was using the photo, and I said, dude, you don't need to sell me on Procore. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm kind of a fan. So, um, so anyway, so it's just, it's what gets me excited is seeing that, and there's a lot of other things. The, our connected, the, the connected nature of our platform. How many people here have ever remodeled or built a house before? Okay, well, this is going to resonate with you. Because you, you'll have to realize that when you did that, you were the owner. You hired a GC. Chances are you probably never worked with that person again, but you might have, um, or prior to that. And, and the subcontractors are all new, and you don't know the subcontractor. That, that alone, just the complexity of that dynamic, uh, means that those folks have to figure out how to work together on a project in order to deliver it on schedule and on, on budget. And if one of those team players drops the ball, everyone loses, right? So the more you could connect the workflow processes across these different legal entities, subcontractors, suppliers, GCs, owners, um, even lenders in some cases, um, the more you can get people working off the same sheet of music, the uh, less risks that are in projects, and we're doing a really good job of connecting all these users on a global platform, so that's, that's exciting too. Let's actually take that a step deeper. Yeah. You, know, you, you talk about you know the job site walk, et cetera. Let's start with, with the GC. Yeah. Just give one or two real granular examples what is it that they're actually doing in your software? Yeah. Uh, well, the first thing you're going to notice when you walk on the job site is uh, everyone has a smartphone, of course. Most of the project managers, superintendents, and foremen have an iPad uh, or some sort of hardened device. Uh, they're going to have the drawings open first and foremost. So it's you know, uh, we were. I got a, I got a, another privilege. Got a tour uh, George Lucas's new art museum in, in uh, Los Angeles uh, oh. like a month ago. Uh, it's a billion and a half dollar um, uh, building. It's two city blocks big. And it looks like the Millennium Falcon. And there's not a straight line in it. It's so freaking cool. Um, but yeah, I, got, I had the opportunity to tour that. And um, they had a, a set of blueprints that was 120 pages thick. Uh, that was what, what they called, a, it was the, the county stamp set. So it was a permit set. Uh, and uh, I looked at them, like, God, I don't see blueprints very often anymore. And they said, yeah, the county makes us. We have to have one set. He, the, the guy that I was talking to said that at one point uh, in previous jobs he's worked on, that they had to um, rent a warehouse just to store all the blueprints that they were using for one particular project because 120 times all the different trades, times every change you make to the drawings, you have to put get a new set for it. And you can't lose the old set because you have to compare. Um, and now they're just carried around their iPad and they can go back and look at previous revisions. They can create an RFI. They can drop a pen on there. They can drop a photo on there. They can do a before and after photo. Like it's just, so you're going to see them with the drawings probably first and foremost. Uh, but then it's RFIs, it's submittals. There's all these terms, art and construction. Because construction is so litigious, uh, they've created all these terms of art that um, are these contract documents that require um, uh, you know, lots of signatures and approvals and workflows to get done. So you'll, you'll see them managing those complex documents. Photos is a big thing. Document control is, is huge, not just the contract documents, but just the documents itself. The budget, I mean, they're always trying to figure out the budget. They're, they're creating change orders on the fly. For all of you who raised your hand, I'm sure you're very familiar with the two least favorite words of an owner, which is change order. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but that happens all every day in construction. So it's pretty much anything that can happen uh, can happen through Procore. Those words are followed closely by delay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, there's only two things in construction that matter, time and money, schedule and budget, right? Yeah. So yes. Uh, you know, most owners, interestingly enough, most owners um, will, they will accept a cost overrun over a schedule overrun. Uh, the, the not having your facility up and running and making, you know, making the widgets that you sell is way worse than spending 2% extra because there was a budget overrun. But yes, that's definitely true. It ma makes perfect sense. The other, the other area that I want to make sure we got into is how you price. Yeah. You know, why do you, how do you price for those that don't know? Yeah. Why did you go that way? And is that actually, you know, a positive or a headwind, especially in an economy like this? So uh, again, I guess today's my day of being vulnerable. I'm going to tell you why we price it this way. Uh, well, in the very beginning, we all, you know, um, all of our competitors were selling seat licenses, right? That's how software was sold. Uh, and uh, first and foremost, our software, the lead software engineer said, we can build in a very complicated management system for seat licenses. Or if you come up with a, a different pricing model, we don't have to put all that energy into creating these, um, you know, this complexity in the code base, and we can start delivering value to the customers. So I went out and started talking to the uh, potential customers, and I'm like, what is, you know, how do you think about price? And they're like, you know, we buy our insurance based off our construction volume. So beginning of the year, they meet with their insurer, and they, they'll come up with a, we're going to do $50 million in construction this year, so therefore our premiums are going to be based in X, Y, and Z. So we're kind of used to a volume-based pricing. So um, I thought, well, there's a great way to skirt the, uh, you know, the, uh, the seat license challenge. And because our mission is to connect everybody in construction on this platform, um, I knew that there were going to be many people that needed to be involved in Procore that were not going to be paying customers. Uh, and if they weren't paying customers uh, and they had to make a decision if they were going to buy a seat or not, that was going to limit the virality of our ability to deliver our solution and to deliver on our mission. So 
um, the construction volume pricing model that we came up with was highly unusual at the time in software. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in fact, I had a lot of our competitors that would come up to me and say, like, that is your death knell. This is going to kill you. Well, what it turns out is, is it turned out to be a huge advantage for us. Our customers tend to love it because they can control the amount of spend that they're going to put on Procore. And it's based off of a pool of, of, of projects, of dollars that go into projects um, that they get, a, they get to use throughout the year. Uh, and if they need more, they can buy more. Uh, and it's, so it just, it just works out really well. I think in an era of uncertainty, which we can all agree, if you just pick up a newspaper, we're in an era of uncertainty, um, having the predictability on pricing and knowing that you can buy as little or as much of it as you want um, is a good thing. Um, and it's, 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 you can't do that with fleet licenses or tokens or whatever people sell. Absolutely. So using that as a segue into just a broader discussion around the economy, the, the one pushback I get is, hey, Sterling, why the heck would I invest in Procore? They're serving an incredibly cyclical industry. You know, how would you answer that? First, I would say the person hasn't quite understood the, uh, the scale of this industry. Uh, the, the, you know, $11 trillion globally growing to $14 trillion in the next few years. Um, and so if you just kind of say, look at it in terms of the scale, number one. Number two is where are we as an industry in the digital transformation journey? Yeah. Uh, very early, early days yet. So um, you know, our, our customers tell us that they can do 50% more construction volume uh, if they run Procore than if they don't run Procore per person. In an industry that's constrained by finding qualified people to do work, being able to do more uh, with less people you know, it, it is, a, uh, is a big thing. So we, we are a uh, value add to anybody who's trying to get construction done. Um, and effectively, the industry is so complex that our products solve for that complexity and help reduce risk. Many years ago, when I was raising capital back in like 2004, I was talking to the president of Swinerton Construction, one of the largest contractors in California, and he's like, pitch me on your product. Give me the two-minute elevator pitch. And I'm like, we're a uh, construction project management sa software platform. And he said, no, you're not. He goes, you're a risk management platform. He goes, we run 2% growth margin businesses. The work that you do helps us not go out of business. And so we don't think of you as project management. We think of you as risk management. So uh, uh, we provide so much value, not just for making people more productive, but to manage risk and create transparency in the product. That even in a um, you know a time of uncertainty, uh, <laughs> there's a ton of demand. And the other thing people don't understand, a lot of a lot of the things that get built are not um, financed with debt, for instance. So interest rates don't really have a, an impact on it. Like you know, uh, the school I was at was not financed with debt. It was a it was a school. Um, you know, all of the infrastructure work and all this other stuff. So there's there's the the construction economy is so big and it's so diverse across so many different sectors that there's always opportunity. Um, our biggest challenge is, is that people read about housing starts and they're like. Oh, the construction industry is falling apart. Well, I think housing, housing plus um, offices is like, you know, around 10% of the overall construction that's done in the U.S. And I'm sure that's uh, true globally. So you, you can, a headline can make you think the industry is struggling. But what happens in construction is when certain um, segments wane, like we've seen with, with offices uh, and office buildings, other, other sectors grow, like the infrastructure bill, the CHIPS Act, all of those, you know, billions and billions of dollars are actually being pumped into uh, sectors that were, uh, smaller before those numbers, those dollars got pumped in. I know I'm talking a lot, but I want to finish by saying our <laughs> customers run diversified portfolios. So everyone thinks of a contractor as their buddy who builds houses. That's not the standard customer uh, of Procore. That's not the standard contractor in the United States. Um, our our customers will run portfolios across many different sectors. Yeah. So they'll have a infrastructure division, they'll have an energy clean energy division, they'll have a uh, multifamily division, and they'll have a, a commercial warehousing whatever division. Uh, and when one area wanes, they just shift their resources to the other sectors where there's actually strength. Um, and so that creates a lot of uh, continued opportunity across this huge tent. So that that gives you a huge amount of opportunity, but there's no segment that's immune to, to what's happening in, nope. in the macro. And I think you called this out a little bit. Can you maybe highlight what are you seeing in terms of some of the, some of the headwinds that have kind of creeped into your customers? Uh, yeah. Uh, the biggest headwind I think that's creeped into our customers is the same headwind that's creeped into every person's mind in America, which is it, doubt about the future, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's not about construction, but it's just, you know, uh, you, you pick up the newspaper, it seems like, you know, seems like the predictions are, are very dire for the world in general. So I think that alone, just a psychological kind of um, kind of a perspective is, is a headwind. Um, yeah, and, and certain sectors do, you know, I mean, I think that the office, the, the, the office, retail, uh, sorry, the office space um, se sub-segment has been pretty much, you know, in, in the tank for two years now. Yeah. Um, but we've done very well because when that went in the tank, people shifted their resources. Um, and so we actually looked at a, a, the overall construction spend in the U.S. over the last few years, and uh, it's just continued to grow. It probably gets bigger every year. Uh, so there's not less to get built, uh, and there's not less you know, demand out there. Uh, so you know, there's more tailwinds, we think, than headwinds. Um, but you know, um, 
I think that, that's that, that our customers do have this little sentiment about, and like everyone else is, like what's the future look like? So there's a, there, when investors look at you, there's a massive global opportunity, but the majority of your business is in the U.S. Is there a sense of kind of how far you've penetrated that opportunity in yeah. the U.S.? Yeah, uh, we said this at Investor Day, but uh, we so we think the U.S. TAM is around 3.5 trillion dollars. Uh, we have about 14% of that construction volume and about 2% of those logos on our platform today. So that, that, by definition, I think means very underpenetrated. Our most penetrated segment in the U.S., which is U.S. GCs, is less than 25%. So if you just thought about Procore as a, as a, as a U.S. company, which we're selling, uh, the opportunity to grow this business is just enormous as the pie even gets bigger. So, uh, so we have a lot of opportunity there. And then, of course, our, the global business, you're right, 85% of our revenue today comes from the U.S. Yeah. Uh, but our, our global business is growing, you know, at or a little bit faster than that. So uh, that business is gonna grow a lot. We look at the TAM, about 10% of the TAM is the US market, 90% is the non-US market. And we're very fortunate that our product is ubiquitous and it can work pretty much anywhere that we wanna go. Uh, so the, the opportunity is to just, if you take off the constraints of the US or just, you know, might. Enormous, know. yeah. 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 Uh, one of the questions that came in is, you know, how can some of the construction material suppliers better work with Procore? Yeah, uh, we have a lot of ideas in that front. So we also we have um, we started some fintech businesses recently, and one of them is a material finance business. Um, this is one level above the supplier, but it essentially gets us the ability to uh, be the purchaser of the suppliers, uh, the supplies for the project. It's, that might sound like a crazy idea, but in the world of construction, there's this um, Thomas Jefferson, our founding father, came up with this thing called a mechanics lien, and the mechanics lien in construction basically says that any materials that get um, purchased for a job, it's the responsibility of the owner of the project that they go onto to ha make sure they get paid for. So you get these secured rights when you purchase materials on jobs. Um, and suppliers, uh, it, it, subcontractors are always strapped for cash because uh, they don't get paid very quickly. That's another business that we're starting um, with, Pro with Procore Pay. Um, but the ability to uh, get those supplies in the hands of the project, it, addition for no, that the, the, the subcontractors don't have to take um, cash off the balance sheet to do it, is a big win. That's allowing us to develop relationships with the supplier. Uh, and the suppliers would love to be able to have um, access to a marketplace uh, in, in Procore, which uh, we have a lot of people at Procore that are, are anxious someday to build a materials marketplace. Um, we have so much data on this platform, it's absolutely just, you know, it's ridiculous. I mean, I can tell you how much a pr price of concrete costs in your hometown, like if I, you gave me 10 minutes, I could go look it up. Um, I don't think anybody else can do that, um, because we have all that data in the system. Uh, and if you needed to buy an air handler for the roof of this building, we can tell you what the warranty issues are on every single product that's ever been installed, because we have all the warranty uh, information in there, punch list items, quality inspection items. We know everything there is to know about that air handler. We could probably tell you, if, as you're designing a building, don't use that Kohler model 123 air handler, because it has a higher cost of ownership. Like those kind of things are really exciting opportunities over the horizon. So you kind of started to frame FinTech, you know, how long does it take to ramp some of these opportunities and where do you eventually see that FinTech opportunity, you know, playing out for Procore? Yeah, well, um, let me, I'll define what they are maybe first. Yeah. Uh, so we, we, we've classified, there's three different discrete businesses that we're building. One is this material finance business, as I mentioned before, helping our subcontractors um, maintain uh, cash on their balance sheet so they can actually take on more work uh, and have less risk by doing those, the, the purchasing. Um, they're, they're, uh, we acquired a company called Level Set uh, a year and a half ago, and they had a they had started this business, and so we're just trying to expand it. Um, all of the businesses I'm explaining right now are, are in the discovery phase; they're not in the execution and um, growth phase. Uh, and so that business itself, we're using some um, cash from our balance sheet to do this, but it's a very little amount; it's inconsequential. Uh, but if this business does turn out to uh, the material finance business take take off, we will find a capital provider that we'll partner with, and we'll just basically be the middleman. We don't want to be a bank. Um, so that's one. We announced last week Procore Risk Advisors. I never believed in a million years that I was going to get into the insurance business, but um, it turns out that in construction, one of the number one costs in construction is insurance. We learned this because insurance companies came to us and said, hey, um, we build all of our risk profiles based off of actuarial data. You all have actually current data and a lot of it. We would like to partner with you. And then we, so we came up with these programs where you know, people would get a disc uh, customers would get a discount if, they, um, uh, if they're a traveler's um, you know, um, customer and they were on the Procore platform made us realize, like, hey, we should look into this. And so we did. We looked into it. And what we found was, this is rough math, but what we found was 5% 5 5 of every dollar that goes into a construction project goes into insurance. That is ridiculous. That is absolutely ridiculous. And then what we did is we surveyed our customers from the best to the most risky, and we asked them what percentage they're paying on their premiums. They're all paying 5%, which means the insurers have no idea where risk lies, and therefore everyone's paying the max. So we thought, hey, wait, let's, let's give this a shot. So we, we did it. We did it. We've been um, trying this, and it seems to be working. We can put together not only a, so we started a brokerage. Uh, we can not only put together a submission, here's something to note. Every construction project 
in the, uh, the US has to have a builder's risk policy on it. So if you're a construction company that has 400 projects, you're buying insurance policies many times a day, right? And it's a pain in the ass. Uh, and you have to fill up these long forms and your brokers you know, don't do any work because you're a captive uh, business. Uh, and they don't really you know, benefit from getting you lower premiums, so you're just whatever. What we do is we put together a submission package of not only the standard form, but we tack on page after page after page of backup data about how they perform on Procore. What does their quality score look like? What does their risk scores look like? What do their performance scores look like? And we, so we put together this comprehensive package. We could submit that as a broker to a carrier uh, and get them much better rates as a hypothesis. Uh, and then we obviously get a uh, commission on that. And um, those commissions are um, they're very healthy. Uh, you can measure those <laughs> in multiples of what our customers pay for our SaaS product. And remember, they're buying project insurance every single day of the year. So it's kind of an exciting business. Three weeks old, we'll see. These are like all the other, th these businesses are all in that trial phase, which is we're learning. Um, and then we have Procore Pay, which we uh, have been talking about for a long time, which we're gonna announce later this year. Uh, we, uh, th that's really exciting. And that's really just getting all of the flow of funds on the Procore platform, from the owner to the GC to the specialty contractor. And you know, in a, in a world where we have hundreds of billions of dollars of um, invoices happening on our platform, there's a, it's ripe for um, moving those funds. And then on top of that, in the future, we can build really interesting businesses like early pay or factoring, um, you know, material supplying, uh, you know, more material supplying, gathering a bunch of data that can be used for other purposes as well. So um, it's, it's really exciting uh, that this is all coming. Well, especially, uh, that's what I've seen in my personal life for, for years is that trapped capital, mm -hmm. you know, that, that payment. The specialty contractors could be doing so much more if there was a faster turnover, yep. you know, in terms of payment, in terms of hiring equipment, jobs that they supply, and just helping the industry as a, as a whole. We had a couple other questions that came in. I want to make sure that you well, get to... That, I will say that one thing people don't understand is that a subcontractor has to be, ha carry a bond. Uh, and, it's, um, and in order to get bonded, uh, one of the biggest criteria is what is the strength of your balance sheet? Well, if you are buying the 800 toilets for the sales force, power uh, as a plumber and you show up uh, with those toilets, you just paid for those. Uh, you're not going to get paid by Mr. Benioff for like 120 days. So you're basically a bank for the project. And that's true with every subcontractor. I mean, people don't really think of it that way. Uh, and so uh, the, the strength of the balance sheet really does dictate the amount of work. So it's not only getting people paid faster, but it's getting people uh, yeah. having stronger balance sheets. Absolutely. Uh, the one that came in is about competition. So what do you see? What is the competitive landscape here in the U.S.? What does it look like internationally? And you know, how do you think about companies like an Autodesk that are both a competitor but also complementary in terms of their software being used through the overall process? So the first thing to note is that still to this day, more than 50% of the people that we talk to as potential Procore customers are coming from Greenfield. It's, they're, not, they're not an Autodesk customer. They're not, they're not an Oracle customer. They're, they're, a, they're a Microsoft customer, right? And so... Um, you know, when we think about competition, it's really dislodging the status quo as opposed to technology. Uh, and that, that, that is still very remarkable. Um, that's, that's true in the US, and it might even be more true globally. We see in these international markets that they seem to be a little bit less mature than the US market. Uh, there isn't a lot of um, true dedicated platforms. There's a lot of point solutions that are out there, but, but not a lot of true platforms in these markets. Um, and so we think that the opportunity is, is, you know, is, is pretty big then. Maybe the second half of your question? Uh, just in terms of who is the primary competition oh. and... Yeah, well, and you asked what, I, what we think of Autodesk. Yeah, Autodesk. how you compete and also complementary in certain I aspects of it. I'm glad you used that term because, so Autodesk is a phenomenal, um, uh, so they have a phenomenal set of products for designers. Uh, and anybody here that raised their hand about building the project realized how disconnected the architect is from the construction process. There's a, um, the, the architect is strictly a, a designer and that they're there to uh, create a something that is a conceptual rendering of what's going to get built, but it's not what gets built. There is a clear delineation between design and delivery. Uh, the way we always say it is, ar architects have wear penny loafers and contractors wear steel toe boots. Right? Two different buyers, two different need sets, uh, and so the fact that Autodesk is, does so well on the design side, and we integrate with all those products on our platform. Uh, but what we do is we, we make it so it's um, relevant to the person in the field. We have a, a great iPad app um, that integrates with what's called a BIM file, which is a three-dimensional um, um, rendering of the, of the building. Uh, we created an iPad app for, for folks that have big, dirty thumbs. And there's these, so you turn your iPad sideways, and there's two giant joysticks, virtual joysticks, that you can fly around and figure out like what that light is and what's behind it and stuff. Um, that's what we do. We help the people in the field get the job done by leveraging the technology with their hands. We're not going to be a design software company. That doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. There's, that's not what we do. We build software for the people that build the world, not the people who design the world. It's just the difference. So do you think that there's a, the 
follow-up question that I always get from investors, well, geez, you know, doesn't it make sense to have a vertically integrated stack? Is it easier to come out of the architect to the job site or, or vice versa? You said you don't want to go to the architect, but how viable is it or what part of the, even the industry, I think about the Boston properties and a few others that maybe have architects, you know, all integrated, maybe, you know, for some accounts it makes sense, but how much of the market really kind of yeah, fits there's, that? It, it, to be totally fair, uh, there is a small segment of the industry that does um, both design and construction, it's called Design Build Fund. Um, but even them, I mean, we have like Ryan Companies is one of the largest design build companies in North America. They are fully Procore enterprise wide, like, you know. Yeah. Uh, but there are some that are just, look, they bought software from Autodesk for a long time because they buy AutoCAD or Revit, and they just decide they're going to buy another product from them. Arguably, our product is just a much better product. We're a platform. There are a bunch of solutions that are not connected. Um, and so the ultimately the experience is, isn't as good. But, um, but yeah, I mean, we, we, we really don't spend a ton of time thinking about them. Yeah. We think about what our customers need. And they do need a Revit file. They need the bin files on their devices. Uh, and we do, a lot, um, we do a lot of great things on top of what they deliver. One of the other questions came in is just talk about how do you sell? What is the go-to-market strategy and kind of where are you in building that out? Yeah, um, we are a very much a direct sales organization in general. Uh, we have uh, we have very um, discrete motions for the enterprise that market and SMB and owner uh, uh, GCs and, and specialty contractors. Um, but I at the core, they're all direct. We are we have a very large focus right now on the more on the SMB side to make it more kind of transactional e-commerce uh, to lower the CAC in those in those particular areas. Um, and so that's going to change a little bit on that front over in the coming years. Yeah. Um, and then in some international markets, some folks just some markets are just reseller markets, right? Um, you know, uh, Mexico is a great example. They the, the firms there want to buy through a trusted software provider yeah. that they know. And so we just we just however the customer wants to buy, we meet them on that, that at that place in that journey. Um, but in general, we still are going into folks that have mud on their boots that need a software solution, uh, as opposed to going to the you know CIO of a company and trying to sell them on a technology stack. We we uh, we get penetrated into companies very quickly when we go into the job site together. Yeah. I love that. I, I always tell people when when I'm discussing Procore. Now that we've talked about it. Pay attention to construction sites. Look for the trailer and look for the Procore flag, you know, <laughs> yeah. hanging off the side of it. Here's a good one. So yesterday, as we're leaving this job site, great group of people, by the way. Um, someone asked, "What's the biggest pro challenge you've had building this building?" And it's a very challenging bu building. This thing, like the the structural engineering, was just mind blowing. Uh, the head of the construction division for the company happened to be there. Uh, he said, "He goes, you know what? Uh, that's an easy one." And we're like, "What?" And he goes, uh, "When the Wi-Fi went down." <laughs> and I'm like, we are in a new age, right? Yeah. And I'm like, bless you, my, my son. Like, that's, you know, <laughs> Procore works a lot better when the Wi-Fi is working than when it's not working. Uh, but it was interesting. And it wasn't like, you know, was the steel delayed? Was it the, you know, yeah. would labor cost a challenge? It was the, when the Wi-Fi went down. That's too funny. Yeah. You said a couple of times, data sets, yeah. massive data sets, yeah. which immediately comes to my mind, those with the biggest data sets feel to me like they can win when it comes to AI. What's AI going to do to your business? Yeah, well, there, it's going to do a lot, I believe. And it's going to do a lot to, I mean, we all know, yeah. it's going to do a lot to a lot of businesses. Um, before I talk about AI, though, I do want to talk about data, because data is not just about AI. Data is about, um, you know, organization of people's businesses around the things that are most important to them. And so data could be people in the system. It can be, you know, documents in the system. So the, the data platform that we have created is just enormous. In fact, when they tell me how big it is, it, I can't even get my head around how large, like, whatever data set that we have now is. Um, and that's that's a real asset for Procore, because that allows us to put together insights that we can reflect back to our customers to allow them to run better, safer demos. So that's that's kind of it, at the core, like the benefit of having a single code base yeah. architecture is that we have all of this data. Um, and so then you look at, okay, well, what, what can you do with AI? Here's a um, spoiler alert, but Procore's had machine learning data scientists on staff for several years plus. Uh, we acquired a company called Indistate.ai. We acquired um, another couple of companies that had some real talent in there. And so we've had a lot of uh, data scientists that on staff that are machine learning experts. Um, we had a lot of focus on image processing first, uh, not as much on the natural language processing like yeah. large language models. Um, and if you think about it in construction, there's a lot of things that you can do with image processing. You, you can, from a photo, you can take, a, you can count the number of two by fours that are on a job site one day, and then you can count it the next day and realize what the production rates are, right? So you can do a lot with um, with doing with applying AI to imagery as well as um, blueprints. So blueprints are tend to be PDFs in a lot of cases. How do you make blueprints into objects? How do you make a room into an object? How do you make an air handler into an air handler? So we can do all that with um, all this um, uh, abilities that we have on the machine learning side uh, for image processing. Now, when it comes to natural language processing, large language models, the way we look at it is there's two advents. Uh, there's the internal, how do we run Procore today? And then the, how do we apply all of this interesting AI and large language models to benefit our customers? 
Um, on the internal side, uh, I have a mandate across my leadership team that um, we, uh, they all have to be on the bleeding edge of knowing how their cohorts and other businesses are applying large language models mm -hmm. to um, optimize their businesses. Uh, and so, you know, my chief legal officer is out talking to his network. My chief data officer is out talking to her network. Um, they're all out there trying to figure out what are people doing and staying on top of it. Because the impact is so high of some of these things can really, I mean, you think about, um, you know, you think about, I was, uh, you know, Satya Nadella was talking about his, about the um, uh, GitHub Copilot, and he was telling me, he's like, Procore needs a Procore Copilot. And uh, I'm like, yeah, and I think about the amount of information if we could load it, if we could train a model with project data to be able to ask it, like, what's the biggest risk on this project? What's the, you know, uh, what day do my plumbers have to be here? What day do the materials have to be, uh, you know, uh, stored in the staging area? Like, all of that data, all of that's in there, and so we should be able to serve that up in a way that's meaningful. Um, we even did a little internal test where we ran some, uh, we trained GPT 3.5 on a, one project's worth of data, and we asked the question, what's the biggest risk to this project? And it kicked back, like submittal 135 uh, has a, um, is, is overdue, and that delay is gonna impact like a bunch of other things, which is gonna cause this project to go over budget and over schedule. We didn't train, we didn't cha train um, uh, GPT 3.5 on what a submittal was, right? That's a very, that's a term of art in construction, but it knew somehow, <laughs> like magically. So I, I, we, we get these kind of insights that like, wow, this is gonna change the world. And when you have the data set, uh, and you have the ability to um, glean insights from it, I think the world is kind of exciting. I think about you know your general contractors and you know pre-construction bids. Yeah. You know taking what you talked about in terms of the marketplace and being able to factor that in uh, among a thousand other parameters to come up with better so it could improve profitability. You know in addition to productivity of the of the users. Honestly, the, the big even the biggest construction companies today, their estimating department, their estimators pick up the phone when they're doing they're they're doing a digital they're trying to do a digital takeoff off of a set of blueprints. They'll pick up the phone and call the supply house and ask what does a yard of concrete cost today? Right. Yeah. Like that's ridiculous. Like that that is and then they do that for everything on there. So the fact that we have all of this data, we should allow you um, access to that data to be able to make better decisions. Um, yeah, from buying out the job. How about, you know, the, the, the number one criteria of how a general contractor selects their subcontractors is how often do I play golf with, with the CEO of that company, right? <laughs> it has nothing to do with the quality of the business uh, that the person's running. It's like, it's my golf buddy. I'm going to work with them. Imagine if you can use quantifiable data, even qual qualitative data, to assess the next best drywall contractor to work with. And imagine the impact on your bottom line as a general contractor if you could do that, and we have all that data. Last question is, um, you put into effect the, the change that was previously announced, which is Paul stepping out of the CFO role into a new role, yeah. uh, and Howard stepping into the CFO role. Maybe just uh, kind of, what is Paul's focus gonna be, and kind of how you're dividing your, your time and attention around that business? So Paul has been, one of my most trusted advisors and, and confidants for years. So uh, he, I know of him as being one of the most capable people on the planet. You, you know yes. Paul too. He's a he's a he's a wonder, uh, uh, you know, just a uh, force of nature. Yes, yeah. the way to look at Paul. <laughs> uh, so my role is to uh, remove all impediments uh, from him and his team as possible, and make sure that they have the resources that they need to be able to learn fast and generate as much game tape as we can, so we can actually go back and look and see what's working and what's not. So um, yeah, he, uh, we're really treating this as a as a separate business unit, um, isolated from the bureaucracy of a bigger company like Procore, uh, and, and able to run fast um, and frankly, you know, learn, which means you break things. Mm -hmm. uh, but if the blast radius is so small, it's just that's what you do. Uh, and so I'm very confident that Paul, like everything else he's done at Procore, is going to have a very big impact. Uh, yeah, Paul. Paul started as like my chief of staff, and then he was the chief data officer, and then he was like head of strategy, and then he, like he's, there's not a job at Procore that Paul hasn't like transformed and made into a uh, an amazing group. So uh, I'm very confident that we got the right guy in the right role, and he's pretty pumped too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, that sounds great. With that, Tui, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Well, thank you, Sterling. Thank you all for listening to me go on and on and on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was fun. Thanks. Yeah.